will go with this uh, now turbulent flow kind of uh, this thing, what do you call the, the energy, kinetic energy of the turbulent flow. So we have been talking about different energy scales. So one is that the energy containing range, then inertial subrange, dissipation subrange. So importantly, what we would like to see is that the turbulent equation for kinetic energy of the mean flow and the fluctuating flow. Uh, so what we can do, we can, so if you look at the mean kinetic energy budget, so mean kinetic energy budget is kind of, uh, this is what, um, So this is what the mean kinetic energy budget is, where you can, the velocity component, the mean velocity component is that kind of considered as a total energy. And you try to put it in back in the transport equation and finally you get the uh, transport equation. So why this transport equation is important? Because the transport equation is going to give you the idea about the different term which is sitting there. And these terms are important uh, for kind of, uh, so what are these terms? Primarily, if we look at that particular equation here, so there are different terms which are identified. One, two, three, four. So if you see these terms, so these terms are, kind of first term is essentially contribute to the production of the kinetic energy. And the second term is the, this is the term which is kind of given the spatial distribution, redistribution of the energy by viscous and turbulent distribution. Third term is kind of a loss of energy due to stress. And finally, you see the term which is there which is your viscous dissipation term, this particular term. So what this total energy budget or the transport equation talks about is that the different term that you are associated with, obviously starting from the, so if you see, even this transport equation has the production, distribution, dissipations and things like that. So it starts, kind of giving you, so if you consider a special case now, so the special case in, in a way, if you think about like, if I have a plain ch channel flow, then you can budget, estimate the different terms, how they are going to contribute. So like your pressure gradient transport equation. So these are very standard work that people have carried out, I mean, to quantify. This is more like in quantify. So idea here is that, that am I, what am I going to get out of this? So what you are trying to get out of this is that the, you try to for a particular flow. So in this case, essentially the channel flow to try to estimate the different terms and the contribution of that. So it will give you, so what does that tell me? It tells me about the contribution of different terms and a, for a particular flow, the contribution of that. So this is what it tells me. So there is uh, nothing else. So if I try to, so this is a very interesting area of research whenever people try to look at the different turbulent flows and things like that, they try to estimate their different budgets. So which one is going to contribute? And from there, they try to do some scaling and things like that. Now. If you look at the turbulent kinetic energy, which is essentially is the half of velocity component square, but these are the fluctuating velocity components. So that if you see. So turbulent kinetic energy also will have a similar kind of transport equation. It also has a production term. It also has a distribution or redistribution term or viscous term. And then finally it's a dissipation term. So these are the term essentially, which gives rise to a particular and again, for a channel flow, you can do some kind of a kind of a simplification or analysis. And these are taken from this um, 
classic paper of uh, uh, Brugem. So you can see how these different terms contribute for a particular channel flow. And also what you can look at it, you can also look at the local energy equilibrium. So if you talk about the particular channel flow, so in which layer, what going to dominate? So, so the dominant balance in the log layer is that, so whatever you have production by the action of the large eddies, they're supposed to be dissipated at the small scale. So from there, what you can find out, so this is an idea is that because my energy has to be conserved. So from this idea, actually what you can achieve is that you kind of find out how this dissipation is going to take place. And that's what gives you that if a dissipation and that logarithm layer is going to be connected with the U tau, which is a fixed velocity and the constant kappa of this, this thing. So this is, I mean, that is something important that how these different terms and the turbulent kinetic energy uh, estimates, they are helpful. They are helpful in getting the scaling loss. So idea is that, and that is where you can apply to one equation turbulence model where you estimate the AD viscosity and from the transport budget term, you kind of close these individual terms in like this. So once you, and that's how you come across with a different. So, but obviously it gives you always some advantage. It comes with some sort of a non a disadvantage. Advantage here is that it accounts for the non equilibrium effect. Disadvantage here is that the mixing length must still needs to be specified. Okay. Now, when you look at this, there are some coefficients. So that is not important how we get, I mean, what are the coefficient values or things like that here. What I am trying to say here is that, so you have got some coefficients which are involved, then those coefficients are required some values. And these values are, I mean, I mean, from different kind of database, which is called the typically the turbulent database. So from turbulent database, these coefficients are determined for a range of flows. But now if you um, kind of uh, uh, try to think that these are going to be valid for every sort of turbulent flow, then the answer is no. But by and large for a bulk or the I mean, large range of flows, they are kind of well performing in that way. Okay, so that's what happens when uh, you do like that. Now, also, if you see that AD viscosity per velocity component, okay? So if you see the AD viscosity per velocity component, again, you go back to your equation and try to uh, find out what are the um, things that you uh, have there and estimate the different things. So obviously, here the summation notation. So now, again, if you simplify the whole business for uh, turbulent channel flow, so these are how the um, things are going to kind of estimated. So you get different terms here, depending on how, so what you can find out the local uh, isotropy in the channel flow mm, and all these things. So these are important uh, parameter to look at it. So obviously this particular classic example, what I'm showing it here. So this going to um, kind of Uh, gives you an idea the different component of the budget term. Okay. So Just give me a second, so.
think perfect. Okay, so here you go. Now, if you see this plane channel, channel flow, the energy conversion process. So that's where you get to see these things kind of a, you have mean kinetic energy, and then you kind of, how the energy con conversion actually takes place. You have turbulent kinetic energy, then these are the different terms. So finally it comes down to internal energy, and then from internal energy is actually dissipates back. Okay, so this is how you estimate your uh, flow field. Now, if you look at the situation where it's a Larle Barnett convection is another classic example where you try to look at the information due to temperature gradient. So you have some buoyancy effect. So obviously due to this uh, effect, buoyancy effect, so you get to see some changes and what happens is that you have uh, this, if you take these two parallel plates, then there is another non-dimensional number which comes into the picture is called the Rayleigh number. And then the, you have some information about the temperature profile between these two plates and they go on actually. So this is an example, I mean, example of a convection in atmospheric clouds. So if you see that, so these are the atmospheric clouds that you get to see, which are uh, very, very um, uh, nice example in nature that gives you an idea about. Now, coming back to that, when I have the buoyancy effect, if you come back to that, then you see these are the, again, the different terms that you have. So these terms, what this contribute is that the production term, so which is uh, due to your uh, kind of an uh, deformation of the renal stress, and then the, you have another term, which is term two, which is here, this is because of your buoyancy effect. So you have a buoyancy production or destruction. So depending on the situation, how your buoyancy is going to act. So either you will have a kind of a production or you might have a kind of a um, destruction. So depending on the situation, you will kind of have a situation like that. Okay. So now, if you see the bind production or destruction, so you can estimate that thing um, using again Bucinus hypothesis. And here, what you can do, you can actually kind of look at this effect, which gets you this idea about. Um, temperature gradients and how this buoyant is going to. So one case you get the buoyant production, other case it's a destruction. So depending on the situation either, so essentially if you look at that particular transport equation and the term sitting there, either it gives you rise to the production. So production means your total energy is going to be increased or it's going to be, uh, if it leads to the destruction, then the energy is going to be down. So again, effect of buoyancy versus here. So here you compare if you have a effect due to buoyancy gradient and where you try to look at due to shear, which is in a plane channel flow. So you have different numbers to define those things, either um, Raleigh number, Richardson number, and so all these different numbers are going to the, so all, now you can, one can do some, now, similarly, you can have buoyancy influence on the overlap region. So overlap regions, if there is an influence, then you can estimate with these parameters, which are going to give you finally some length scale. So idea here is that, so one case you have buoyancy, other case you do not have buoyancy. So because of the buoyancy and this, um, these things, you have some sort of a temperature gradient as well. And so where it's going to impact, it's going to impact essentially the scaling. So these scalings are why they are important. The importance because when I do turbulence modeling, this, these scalings are going to be important. How am I going to? So if you see here exactly when I have a turbulent bounded layer, so how these factors are. So these numbers are not important because uh, I mean I mean the number all this. What is more important is that you see how they are going to. So essentially, you get some sort of a scaling. So idea is that when I have a turbulent bounded layer, then how that scaling factor is going to operate. Now with that, if you come to the 
now if you again recap back your description of the Rand's equation, these are the obviously in an incompressible situation. So what is missing here is missing here is that this particular term, which you have called is the Reynolds stress term. So that needs to be closed because that is there is no closure model for this Reynolds stress term, which is making this whole system, I mean, unclosed. So obviously this we have already talked about it. There are two different components. One is the isotropic, another is the deviatropic parts. And then you estimate the AD viscosity with your characteristics length scale. So the first hypothesis was that the turbulent viscosity hypothesis number one, where you can make some analogy. So with the molecular stress using kinetic gas theory. So you consider this kind of 1D laminar profile and then finally you kind of get to correlate from the characteristics length in your mean free path, mean molecular speed. So you go to that micro, essentially what happens in fluid mechanics, you kind of can get back all your macroscopic property from the microscopic. But now one can solve all these stochastic turbulence flow field using really at the microscopic level, but it's going to be really I mean, computationally expensive, time consuming. So the best possible way that we solve in the using continuum hypothesis uh, in my macroscopic state. So now similarly, you have second hypothesis where you say that, okay, lambda, which is typically happens is that, that the lambda, I mean, the mean free path, which is very, very small compared to the length scale of them. So this length scale, exactly what we are talking about, which is going to produce the large size eddies. For so then, if that is the scale, then you can say that turbulent mixing is essentially become non-local. So the turbulent viscosity hypothesis still give you some reasonable result when your production and discuss dissipation rate are in local balance. So that means what it says that whatever kinetic energy production is there, so it has to be balanced with your local destruction. If there is no balance, then obviously that's going to be somehow accumulated in some uh, somewhere. So then follow the similar thing. So there is a simplest model, which is called the turbulent viscosity model, constant turbulent viscosity. So then you can estimate your AD viscosity with this kind of um, a simplified system. And then when you come to a slightly advanced one, where you use the Prandtl mixing length model, where you say that AD viscosity is based on some mixed length. So these are very simplified approach. And I'll come to that, how these things are getting complicated as you move. Uh, so you need some mixing length uh, data and things like that, then you can estimate. So these are the best possible way to estimate the AD viscosity. And once you estimate the AD viscosity, you are going to kind of close that Reynolds test term, which, which remain unclosed in that particular system. Okay, so, and now continuing that, so you move to one equation turbulence model where you have a turbulent kinetic energy, which you solve. Okay, I'll skip this for the, and finally you kind of have a turbulent viscosity model where you have kind of heard about this K epsilon, K omega kind of model. These are often used in the common in CFD. These are uh, two equation model. So you have different layer of models. So simplified model, which is a mixing length model, the mixing length model to you move to this kind of a one equation, then two equation, things like that. So, and then finally you have a transport equation for epsilon. So you have a epsilon, I mean, basically the equation for the dissipation. So the dissipation, once you solve, then you can balance these things out. So here is the equation for the turbulent kinetic energy and turbulent dissipation. So what is the correlation that is used is, is that the, this is how you estimate the productions and the dissipation. So ideally, whatever is produced, then that has to be dissipated. If that is not dissipated, then you can estimate like that. So if you have a sudden increase in production, then there would be increase in turbulent kinetic energy. So that kinetic energy has to be cascaded down. Okay. So obviously this is going to increase your K by epsilon. So increase in the dissipation tends to decrease the turbulent kinetic energy. So this overall, this process, this process always, this is what we call it a turbulent cascading energy cascading process. So this process always repeats itself and we try to balance that out. So that's the idea. And these are the equation of the K epsilon. I think you can find it in any textbook. I mean, and the way coefficients are kind of estimated. So let's skip this portion. So yeah, this is some important note here that how we are performance. 
so you require some special treatment in the bond uh, i mean in the viscous wall region so this is what i was referring why those um, uh, turbulent boundary layer profiles are important because when you use this kind of model then you actually need to be careful about that now the slightly higher end model is the reynolds trust model I mean, trace model, what it does that. Now, instead of you have that mixing then theory or two equation capsule models here, what is happening is that these are the Reynolds trace terms. So these Reynolds trace terms, you actually have a transport model for that, which also having some production term, then viscous and turbulent transport term, pressure strain term, viscous dissipation. So you solve this individual component of the Reynolds transport equation as an Reynolds trace model. So what it does, it does that probably it is going to give you a better correlation or closer for the Reynolds test term. That is number one. Number two, what it can do that, I mean, it would it could give you also probably to some extent capture the uh, some local anisotropy. And thirdly, it's going to be obviously computationally expensive if you try to use it because you are now top of your um, con I mean continuity momentum. You are going to solve six more extra equations. So here, what is important is that, as I said, you don't require any closer model. So isotropy of the microstructure, that means the local anisotropy that is there that you can capture. So, but obviously this can make things expensive in terms of computational uh, efficiency because you are going to solve some more extra equation. That is what is mentioned here, computationally expensive. So, uh, I mean, obviously, if your local turbulence level is much higher or there is non-linearity or non-local, then you can use this kind of model, which is always a better than. Now, apart from that, what you can do when you talk about this turbulence, mm, uh, different turbulence scales and things like that, so you can solve DNS. What is DNS? It's going to solve the every kind of scales. So you solve your actual equation uh, I mean, this is your RANS equation. So you solve your momentum and continuity equation and you resolve. How you resolve that? You resolve through your small scale of the grid and things like that. So um, you are going to capture everything. So this is what DNS done. So, I mean, this is also taken from this particular paper. So you can see the flow structure that DNS captured. So every small bits and pieces of the flow structure that you will be able to capture. But this is what is the advantages. Now, obviously, as I said, DNS can give you the complete description of the turbulent flow field so that every scales, length scales, and all these things, spatial scale, you can capture. But obviously, it's going to be expensive in the sense, yeah, I mean, you have to, to resolve that kind of uh, level to that level. Your grid size is going to go up. Then you can always um, kind of um, capture things like that. So this is what DNS does. And you can see there is some sort of an empirical estimate of what could be the grid size and things like that. And these are some of the computational time you can see for a simple problem where, so even today, if you go to large scale um, uh, engineering problem, DNS is a little bit restrictive because we cannot really afford to do that. Obviously with the um, kind of the architecture we are getting every day and the kind of Mm, computing uh, facilities that we are having these days, probably in the near future, we will be able to even solve those kind of problems through DNS. Mm, uh, okay, so this is a calculation of the computational cost. So now another uh, spectrum is that, okay, we had RANS where you have all the mean flow field and things like that. And then you have the other extreme where you go to oh, DNS and you resolve everything. So that means that every small scale you resolve. So in between there is a LGS. What it does, it essentially solves the large scales and then the small scale it actually models. So ideally, LES is an intermediate between RANS and DNS, but it is much more closer to DNS. So, and you do some sort of it, either you do some explicit filtering or the implicit filtering. So you go close to DNS and kind of um, uh, resolve the flow field. So if you look at that, is an advantage, yes, one hand, because it's will, I mean, quite, I mean, popular and better than the RANS. Obviously, it is not like uh, DNS. At the same time, this is also 
computationally quite expensive if you want to do proper uh, LES. So this is an example, we can skip that. So yeah, so what happened is that LES will do the filtering. So these are the explicit filterings. You have this kind of original flow feed, you do the filter and then you reconstruct back. So what happens is that LES, you decompose that's a filtered component and the fluctuating component and then use this fixed, uh, this is the filter function and then you get back your macroscopic or the mean properties. And the term which will appear in your governing equation, this is called the, not the Reynolds stress term, this is called the subgrid scale, uh, sub scale stress term. And this is what is modeled. And initially it was proposed by Smagorensky. That's what it is very famous. There is a Smagorensky LES model. So here also what you try to estimate is that you estimate this one with the uh, stress term and finally you get so this is a typical example of the LES flow field in a channel, how you can estimate the different parameters and things. Now, when you say, so that means I have different ways to capture and all these things. So, but when you actually try to characterize the turbulent flow field, there are, I mean, few things like statistically homogeneous turbulence, you do two point auto covariance calculations, you do the normalization of that. So these are the things. So here, if you see, this is the, you take a velocity component at one point and the distance in between that you try to characterize that. So these are some of them. And obviously from there, you find out the integral length scale. So why it is important? Because this length scale and all these are going to play an important role, not only your modeling of the turbulence, as well as you are, I mean, when you are going to model your turbulent combustion. So now if you, Try to see the correlation between space versus time. So you see that there would be one and would be statistical turbulence, another statistically stationary turbulence. So here you estimate the two point auto covariance, you have a frequency spectra, you have the integral time scale, Taylor micro scale, and all these parameters. So these are the characteristics. So from your data set, you can estimate all these things so that you properly characterize your turbulent flow field. Now, how do the scaling? So this is there very nicely. So you have three different range. One is the energy containing range and energy containing range. This is going to be the scaling of that. You have dissipation rate, which is at the smallest scale at the esteem, other esteem, and then the inertial rate, where you can see that it is going to be minus five by th uh, three law, which is the Kolmogram proportions and very really nicely captures that. And so the complete energy you can estimate back. And this is how, if you see an example where, I mean, uh, the spectrum, if you remember in the earlier session I was showing, so this is what happens, your energy containing range, then you have inner cell sub range, you have a dissipation range, and you see the scaling law, this satisfy this particular curve. So if you put them back in kind of in totality, you have unsteady and three-dimensional flow field, which is clear. That means it's irregular, chaotic, you have large scale structure, small scale structure, then it's high Reynolds number, dissipative, so it affects in mixing and things like that. So obviously the parameter which is going to dictate whether the flow is turbulent or not, obviously most of the time you do that to the Reynolds number. Then if you have internal flows and otherwise if you go the natural convection, you use the Raleigh number, okay? So now I'll talk about a little bit of the turbulence modeling. So what is important is that because either you can conduct experiments and then try to characterize your turbulent flow field. But most of the time, if you have a complicated geometry flow field, it's not that easy to characterize those things. So what is there is that you try to model that. And that is why turbulence modeling is very, very important. So what are the things that is going to be so critical about that? Obviously you have turbulence model and then the near order treatment because as I said that when you go to close to that particular situation, then obviously these are important, then you have to kind of correlate with the computational grid and whatever resources you have, how quickly you get the, the data. So these are very, very important component of it. So one has to make some choices. So how you are going to do that? So as I said, you see the turbulent flows field can be modeled in multiple ways, which we have been talking about. The simple equation is the correlation based or integral equations. Then you do RANS. You see this way, if you go down, it is increasing the order of accuracy, but at the same time, the expense also. So I can have RANS, 
which is kind of solving the average equations or mean flow field equations, we get closer. Then I can have LES, which is quite uh, sophisticated compared to RANS, but not obviously DNS, or I can go to DNS. But this can go in the order of accuracy at the same time order of. And how this happens, you see here. So this is what I was talking about. So I have an energy, I mean, the large scale here, coming here, then there is a cascading process. And then finally, it goes through the dissipation. So this is my complete spectrum of the energy in a turbulent flow. Field. Now, what does... So if you try to resolve everything, this is what you do in DNS. So that's why DNS says everything is resolved. That means starting from my large scale to the smallest scale of the dissipation, I have resolved. That's why DNS is expensive. What do you do in the LES? This portion of the spectrum you resolve this small portion you model. And that is why I said it is close to DNS because if you see this particular bar here, if I push toward this side, more and more this side, then I'm going towards the DNS side. But that is why the LES is quite handy, quite sophisticated, and it kind of resolves the large scale structure, which are mostly going to carry the energy. And then the small scale, it has some closer model so that um, and this is called the subgrid scale model and the three which you model that. But on the other extreme, in the RANS, you have pretty much maximum portion is kind of modeled. That is why RANS is not going to give you the complete picture of your turbulence level, but it obviously good to get data in quick turnaround time and as well as mean flow equations can be solved very easily. This has been a, a design tool for industry over the years but slowly due to this, as I said, the computing facilities or efficiencies are getting increased. So these days people try to do LES more often compared to RANS. Okay. Now, if you see or try to do this turbulent modeling approach, then what it happens is that, as I said, this is the increase in computational cost. This is include more physics. So I have at the basic zero or one equation model, I have a bunch of two equation models which are very, very popular in the community, in safety community. And because they are easy to, I mean, if you are doing programming and things like that, easy to do that, but they are easy to be run quick and you have larger dissimulation than DNS. So it's a balance. And as a user, one has to make a choice what I want. Okay. So uh, these are the things we have already talked about that DNS, you resolve everything. So it's going to be advantage you resolve every scale. But disadvantages request huge computational resources. So, and also it is limited to simple geometry. If you go to LES, bulk of the energy is resolved, small scale is model. At the same time, this is also very, I mean, obviously promising, but at the same time, this is also computationally expensive. And I mean, this is again the how your filtered equation looks like. So, this is. Uh, or use the subgrid scale Reynolds tensor and this picture shows you that how you solve it. Now you go to RANS, it doesn't resolve the complete spectrum. That means I won't be able to resolve all the flow field, I mean the scales of the turbulent flow, but it is good to get the data in quick turnaround time. It would give you quite a good approximation for the mean flow field, but obviously you require closers and things like for the Reynolds system. Okay. Now, in RANS, what you do, you basically do the ensemble averaging, which we have already talked about in detail. So you do this ensemble averaging, then decompose the flow field in two component. One is the mean and the fluctuating component. And then finally, you put it back in the RANS equation. So this is how you do it. So these are the two component. If you put back in the equations, in your, this is your momentum equations, you finally get back this Reynolds test. And this is where you need closer. Okay. And what are the closures you have? You have one equation model, you have two equation model and things like that. So this is the final equation which will look like. And then if you have the closure, so if you have different closure, so either I can have zero equation, that means this is purely algebraic correlation based model. So these are, I can have one equation models, then I can have two equation models and I have second order models, which are the Reynolds stress model where I would solve for individual Reynolds stress component. That means six more extra equation I have to solve. So this is again, even within the RANS, this is what the order of complexity. Obviously, when you increase the order of complexity, it's going to result something more. So if you do RANS, 
if you do the error space model, obviously it's going to give you some more extra information. It will be able to capture some of the flows, which is probably two equation model or zero equation model may not be able to resolve it. So it's a compromise between your advantage and complexity, computing resources and things like that. So here again, you use this Boussinet's hypothesis to close down the model so we can come here. So finally, you have this Reynolds test term that we have already talked about, which gives rise to your eddy viscosity. So idea is that, okay. So this is another non-dimensional number, which is called the Tabula Smith number. So this will arise when you have the mass transfer equation. So like your momentum transfer, if you have the mass transfer equation, so this is going to come. And turbulence Smith number is important especially because you are talking about turbulent reacting flows. So whether it is with spray or without spray. So that is very, very important. So not only your uh, uh, continuity momentum energy is there, then you have to have the species mass transfer equations where the turbulence Smith number is going to come up. And this is uh, how the, uh, and then you have the mixing length model. So this is how estimated the mixing length. Uh, so the idea here is that you want to estimate the AD um, viscosity. So if you put there, obviously easy, fast calculation time for simple flows, good prediction, but obviously it is in, uh, not capable enough to capture complex flows, um, uh, different kind of uh, turbulence level. But it's sometimes very handy if you want to generate, or earlier it used to be used very um, often. Now you go to one equation model, which is the spallet elements model. Here you solve for one extra equation for eddy viscosity. This is also quite economical because you are solving one more extra transport equation, um, wall bounded flows and things like that. But there is a problem, especially when you have separated flow. Though this model is quite popular in external aerodynamics calculation, but this fail to capture the separated flow miserably. So free shear flow also, it doesn't work properly. Decaying turbulence, it doesn't work. So there are some restrictions, but keeping that in mind or having said that one has to be kind of, a, I mean, you have only few choices between either simplicity or complexity, computation and power, and what can give you the best possible result in quick. So again, these are already we have done. So how you estimate, so in two equation model. So here you have the turbulent kinetic energy. So you, kind of solve for that extra equation for the turbulent kinetic energy and the, also the, for the dissipation. So these are the standard Cape Salon model where you have one equation. So, I mean, this is steady. So if you have unsteady, then you have the term here, extra term you will have in the unsteady term. So you have convection. So like any generate transport equation, you can see it has convection term, it has generation, Diffusion, dissipation. Similarly, dissipation rate also, you have generation, diffusion, and destruction. So it just behaves like a uh, standard transport equation, and you have all these coefficients, which are empirical coefficients. Now, how do you find out that? So these empirical coefficients are proposed for after doing a lot of experiments for the standard flows and for other, I mean, they work, as I said, for a wide range of flow, they work nicely. But if you go to complicated flows, then they don't work properly. So this is again, okay. Again, if you look at the mean flow equations where you have, as I said, the unsteady term. So this is the unsteady term. This is the convection. So this already we have talked about that. Mm, yeah, this is turbulent kinetic energy. So here is the, okay. So you have some sort of an uh, modeling is required and these are the typical values of that. So let's skip that. Uh, similarly, you go down to turbulent dissipation where you have a transport equation for this. So, um, so what you do, you get an equation like this. So this equation also having an unsteady term and you have so many other terms sitting here. So obviously when you go from mixing length to one equation to two equation, these are the uh, I mean, price that you pay. It becomes a little complicated. But as I said, these are quite popular and work for so this is the final equation if one has to look at it very nicely and these are the model proof constant, you see. So these model constants are good at the same time they are problematic. Because if you change, I mean, try to use the uh, this turbulence model for different flows, then obviously this may not work. 
So again, so the idea is that one has to be careful when you are going to use this kind of model, what kind of flow. So from your K and epsilon, you estimate the AD viscosity like this and then close the Reynolds test term like this. Okay. So this is how you do. So what one can think about, obviously some advantages, simple, easy, reasonable prediction for all flows, but obviously these are the flows you can see it doesn't work. So there is a lot of restriction. So if you blindly use K epsilon flow for all sort of different turbulent kind of situation, this is going to give you, I mean, wrong results. So, one, so for that only one has to understand when you use a particular turbulence model, especially from the modeling aspect, what it produces and what is the underlying physics that it can capture. So obviously when you do modeling, it cannot capture everything. So you have to kind of aware of what you are using, okay? So in this category, you have some other model like a epsilon RNG model, realizable model, K omega model, algebraic stress model. So there is a bunch of ones which one can use. So these are some of the improvement over RNG K epsilon. So some flows essentially like a standard K epsilon compared to that, this RNG works better. So like here, the, some improved predictions that you can see that some of the flows it can be captured uh, better. So these are the equation for the RNG. So you can find out in textbook also, uh, no need to go through these equations. So um, these are, yes, again, you have some improvement over realizable K epsilon. So, I mean, J8 and all this, you can find some better prediction. So if you see, even the family of two equations, different models behave properly in for different scenario. So one can kind of use this kind of uh, uh, predictions where they are going to use them, be careful about that. So these are again equation for realizable K epsilon. So only thing if you see there is a change here, which is important. So finally, you estimate your AD viscosity like that, but the C mu, the coefficient is calculated with some extra factor. So these extra factors are going to play the critical role in improvement of the prediction. Okay, rest looks fine. I mean, these are the um, C epsilon, so yeah, so it has the normal stress, so we can skip this, okay. Similarly, you go to K omega model, so omega is the turbulence frequency. So instead of K or epsilon, you can solve for um, K and omega and you get an estimate. So, and then you can have algebraic stress model. So these are the um, different variant of the family of this uh, equation system. And if you go to nonlinear model, then you go for this Reynolds stress models where you have this, which you solve for the transport equation now the second order closer, that means the Reynolds transport model where you have the convection terms, it is R, I, J here, this particular one, which stands for your Reynolds transport component. That means U, I, J, U, I prime, U, J prime. You have production, you have kinetic energy, destruction, diffusion, and all this. So it's just like an another transport equation. So what you get, generation equation is computed like this. Then you have pressure stress strain correlation, you have dissipation, then you have turbulent diffusion. So if you look at this term, what it does that, obviously it does some more extra bit of calculation, but at the same time, it, it is able to perform better for certain flows. It can give you some extra bit of information about the local turbulence and things like that, but it's going to be expensive. So like, as I said, it can be used for com predicting some complex for like swell flows, rotations, high strain rates. So like, I mean, some of them are mentioned here, okay? So yeah, this is your final, if you write it in a generic form, this is the Reynolds stress transport equation, how it looks, I mean, it has all the component. So, and I have already shown you how the components are going to be estimated, mm, okay. So the important point to be noted here is the production term is in exact form. Obviously the diffusive transport term is use the gradient hypothesis. So that's how you estimate. And dissipation term, which is epsilon, which is a standard epsilon equation, you calculate that from pressure trends correlations are very important. So this includes the pressure fluctuations and things like that. So uh, that includes between the eddies and the region of the flow where you want to calculate the mean velocity. 
but it doesn't change. And obviously, transport due to rotation is also in exact form. So these are your production term. You see that this is your diffusion term transport, where you use this is uh, this is uh, your finally the diffusive transport model here. And then you have the dissipation, which is also in exact form. This term is important. This is a pressure strain correlation term, which includes the pressure fluctuation. You see this pressure fluctuation is sitting here. Now, as I said, this involves a lot of physics, but at the same time, one has to be careful because what it may do is that um, it can create some sort of an, I mean, I mean, uh, numerically expensive is one aspect of it, but the other aspect is that because of this, some of this term like this pressure strain pollution, some things can become numerically also steep. So the stability of the equation system can be an issue sometimes. Obviously the boundary condition and all these are very important aspects. So one has to do that. So there is no question about it. So it is depending on any particular I mean, calculations that you do, so where you have to do that. So if I kind of put them together, if you see, so you have spallet almanus model, which is one equation model. So simple one, then you have standard K epsilon model, RNG, realizable, standard K omega, SST K omega. So it talks about what you solve for, which is a K and epsilon or K and omega with some improvements to different levels. And you solve for RSM where you solve this second order terms. So it's again, some sort of an order of complexity increase. Obviously it allows you to get you some extra bit of information. So now if you talk about the behavior and uses, obviously Spallard-Lalmanus model would be the economical out of this particular lot. It works for some flows. It doesn't work for certain flows. Same thing goes with the standard K-Epsilon, which is robust, widely used, but obviously when you have a strong separation, swell flows, things doesn't work. Shear flows, RNG works better, free shear flows and things like that, but Obviously, it again fails for separated flows. Realizable, similar way, produce some extra bit of a benefit for certain cases, but other cases. So overall, the idea is that you have these different models, but they behave certainly for certain cases. Other cases, it doesn't. Okay. So now, if you see the strength and weakness, obviously the weakness is not very widely tested. Standard key epsilon is gives you some results and widely used, can be robust. RNG, obviously some limitation for isotropic eddy viscosity. There is a limitation for realizable. Reynolds stress requires more effort, but obviously some strength are there. It can capture more physics. Uh, some round jet, when you have a free round jet, it realizable capsule works better than all of these. For some complex behavior, swelling flow, RNG works better. Standard capsule works for certain standard flows. Now all this model, one is important factor is that the near all treatment. So you have to use some sort of a wall function because the law, uh, I mean, you saw this law of the wall. So where you have this inner viscous sublayer, overlap layer, and outer layer. So you have to capture those things. So standard wall function, then you can have non-equilibrium wall functions. So these things you can use. So, so modeling that, this is what is a very famil uh, familiar. So you have this viscous sublayer, waffle layer, you have fully turbulent region and the outer layer. So all these, you have some correlations of the, uh, with the velocity with the Y plus. So this way you have to bring it into your modeling. Otherwise what happens is that you will not be able to capture. Once you bring in, bring in this near all treatment, it can um, be handy so that you can decide how much Y plus you can resolve and things like that, okay. So there are some wall function modeling. So you have the standard wall function modeling where you do like this. So you can see how the grid looks like to capture that, or you can have enhanced wall treatment. So then you kind of close to the wall, you refine the grid so that even you are able to fit that particular law of the wall properly. So that is why we discussed the law of the wall because it comes handy in this kind of uh, regimen. So you have standard wall function, which are going to estimate between you the Y plus and the U plus and all these things so that it is kind of going to map that thing. 
or you have non equilibrium wall function so the standard wall functions are modified for stronger pressure gradient system and non equilibrium flow so this works for some some sometimes for the separating and reattaching flows when you have body forces so these are the different near wall treatment that you have or one can have enhanced wall treatment okay so that means you have some extra bit of modification where you use this enhanced wall treatment and you may have two layer model where you can kind of do some sort of a blending and things like that so that gives you extra bit of more flexibility and sometimes some sort of a robust robustness and things like that okay so obviously when you do that the one important parameter that is required to be calculated is the y plus because this is something is very very important so once you do that calculation then you can see how much you can resolve the near wall for a particular flow how much is required then accordingly you choose okay what model would be best fit for that system okay so now you have near wall modeling strategy so you have the standard wall function or non equilibrium wall function so you can have um, high Reynolds number flow problem um, depending on the characteristics of the flow so that means all this modeling approach or the aspect that would come into picture depends on the driving force is your physics. What physical problem you are going to capture and how you are going to capture, that is what is going to be important and that is how you are going to use which particular model you are going to use in this. So now, obviously, when you use this different RANS model or the ELIS model or DNS and things like that, then one important aspect is that boundary conditions. So that is true for any modeling approach that what boundary condition you use. <clears throat> so the so turbulent intensity, turbulent length scale. So based on which parameter you can use those things, so one has to be kind of doing the calculation for those parameters because these parameters are going to be very, very important uh, in terms of boundary conditions and things like that. So once you do these calculations and the, I mean, the boundary conditions aspect and all these things, so these are, uh, these are uh, going to affect your uh, simulation because uh, how how much now one aspect here is that this turbulent intensity sometime in a turbulent flow with the boundary condition we use this turbulent intensity now when you use this turbulent intensity so there is a kind of an uh, idea is that i can increase the turbulent boundary condition the intensity in terms of or you can provide in terms of kinetic energy so in, uh, so the idea here is that, okay, I can increase the inlet turbulent intensity really to a high value, then my flow is going to be more and more turbulent. But that's a very, very wrong concept. Because if you, why that's a wrong concept in terms of modeling is that if you increase that turbulence um, intensity too much, your transport equation is going to see that turbulence immediately. And so it is going to behave like in production. So once you have too much of production, dissipation is going to take it down. So what happened? The flow may be laminar. So you have to be careful when you use these boundary conditions. So if you sum up those things, that what are the important things that one has to be careful about? What flow physics you want to do? Your resource of computational resources. Then what is the accuracy and um, time frame of uh, getting things done? Uh, so this is what is going to be. And then the particular turbulence model, near all treatment, then obviously the modeling procedure and things like that, whether you are going to use the two equation based family or the uh, other one. So if I continue the summary, so obviously the turbulence modeling having a varying degrees of complexity, depending on the choice of turbulent models, what you are going to use. 
So DNS and LES are still very challenging. They but they are very very attractive and promising though. But LES are I mean having a lot of popularity these days. It is it is very often used. Not earlier days. Two equations are model are still very widely used or widely popular model. But obviously you get some improvement with um, this thing the RSM model. Okay. So that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about on the turbulence modeling. So before we move ahead with the now to the turbulent combustion, and if you have any questions, please let me know. You may raise your hand, uh, then I can just, or if you type the question, then I would answer that before I move to the next part. Any question, doubt, or anything? Okay, so then I will go ahead with the next component of the one, which is your turbulent combustion. So that's very, very interesting. Okay. So now we talked about turbulent, okay? And turbulent is your underlying behavior of this all reacting system that you are talking. So we have been talking about the spray atomization, spray reacting system, non reactive and probably you are going to reacting system now on. So far what you have been kind of exposed to the non reacting system but the turbulence is there. But when you come to reacting system, you see there's a connections here. They are kind of making a lot of handshaking, turbulent reaction in their applications. And application varies from a simple flow to a different kind of situation like an astrophysics. So what one important parameter is the Reynolds number or key parameter is the Reynolds number. Because Reynolds number is only one parameter that's going to dictate how this flow is going to behave, okay? But what is the turbulence level? How my reaction is going to behave? And you can see how the, so this is an example of an mixing in turbulent free air flow. You see this uh, different range of um, mixing level. So this was an experimental image, but when you come down to reacting system, there are two different, situation one could be premixed one could be non premixed now every segment again can be divided into two component one is laminar which probably we will not talk about too much here also same thing what is important is the turbulent and what are the applications area they are different applications area and under that most of the your spray atomization falls under the non premixed turbulent combustion but this is what we talk about in terms of flames. Now in the atom spray, there has have been, been some more complexities because of your two-phase system. You have atomization taking place. Then those uh, small particles or the atomized uh, particles are getting evaporated. So you have different, different length scale. You have different time scale, which are important. For example, if you think about, you talk about only turbulent flow, then you have only length and spatial scale to deal with. And that even such a wide range of the different and scale that you need to talk about. When you go to turbulent reacting system, obviously the reactions are going to having a time scale and they are going to be kind of, I mean, talked about. So there you can see the image, here is a particular flame. You see this different, I mean, even in these particular locations and near to the exit, you see the flame structure. And it has a lot of different species which are involved. So that means when I have turbulent reacting system, important factor is that the turbulent chemistry interactions, how the turbulence, that means the eddies, the large scale eddies, small scale, how they are going to interact with my uh, flame form. So, so far I had problem with my turbulent flow, which is having a large range of spatial and temporal scale. Now I have a reaction which is also a different scale and the species. 
So that is how the complexity goes up. Top of that, you have two phase system. Then your atomization, evaporation, these are going to be. So now if you talk about only gaseous combustion, because the idea here is that I talk about these things and then once you spray comes, you see the complexity level. So you have laminar, you have the complex diffusion property, you go to turbulent flow, wide range of flow and time scale, you have chemistry species, then you have a different chemical skin. Then the thermal radiation, if you have shoot, strong coupling. So the idea is that the challenge, how well you can handle this in a computational model. But at the same time, you cannot compromise on the physics and even able to. So this is the level of complexity we talk about. So far, only we are happy with the turbulent flow. Now this is going to create more trouble. So if you see the laminar premix flame, they are very simple, like a flame which is looks like an I mean, you know, I mean in a simple canonical system, they look so nice and all these things. And if you at the same time look at a turbulent flame, see the flame structure here. And this is the zoomed in image of that. What it does, very simple. You have more and more turbulence, then is going to affect your kind of uh, flame surface. So these are the things where you get more wrinkles and that is happening because of your small scale eddies which are interacting with the flame front. So the flame fronts are going to be more wrinkled. So that means the effective surface area increases. Okay, so once that happens, this is going to again affect your turbulence chemistry interaction and that brings you to here. So if you look at that turbulent reacting flow, you have different kind of spectrum and eddies and things like that. So you have, and the turbulence are required very much because you are going to have this large eddy leading to incomplete mixings and things like that. Then you have this turbulent reacting system, which is going to kind of uh, having this small scale mixing, diffusions, interaction of this flame front and it's going to effectively increase your flame surface. So once you increase your flame surface, so that means you have this wrinkling in the flame surface, that's going to increase your effective surface area. So in a nut cell, it's going to increase your volumetric heat release or the reaction source time. So once your reaction source time increases, that is what the heat release is. So that is going to increase your local turbulence because once you have a heat release increases, it's going to increase your temperature. So once it's going to increase your temperature, it's going to reduce your density. So that means if you want to conserve your momentum, automatically local flow velocity increases. So that means your local turbulence increases. So if your local turbulence increases, that's going to again affect the spectrum. So this becomes a closed loop cycle. So the turbulent reacting flow is such a complicated system because of this. So you cannot eliminate one from the, or decouple one from the other. One can say, okay, I resolve my turbulence. I don't worry about my reaction system, but that doesn't work in that fashion. So they are going to effectively interact with each other and they will have an exchange of their interactions as well. So if they don't have the interaction, then there would be no problem, which is a laminar situation. But in turbulent situation, they are going to interact heavily. And that's why turbulent reacting flows are challenging. Now you are talking about here sprays. So apart from this, now you have atomization, you have evaporation, and then the reaction. So that's the level of complexity you are talking about that. Okay. So once you talk about that, then obviously this we have already talked about. Your length scale is important, smaller scale is important, then dissipation is important, turbulence and summer is important. These are the parameters that you often talk about in a turbulent flow field. Now, when you come to chemical time scale, so now there is a problem here because your flow time scale goes in a different range and this is how your chemical time scale go. So there is a huge order of magnitude change. So here, this is our integral time scale. This is your Kolmogorov time scale. Now, when you come down to reaction, there is going to be another time scale, which is chemical time scale, which is way smaller than that. So how are you going to map that? Because if you try to solve your system at the chemical time scale level to resolve that, then it's going to take huge time, which is next impossible to do even today. Because the, you can see the chemical time scale range. So that means species to react or any reaction to happen. And it's a multi-species system that you are talking about. So you need some hand signal. So you 
kind of do some compromise and that's where the modeling comes into the picture and we talk about combustion models we talk about turbulence chemistry interaction model the turbulence chemistry interaction model are nothing but making this hand shaking to reduce the gap between these different length and time scale and that's not apart from this turbulent Reynolds number you have turbulent Damkolan number and Karlovy's number. These are two important numbers which pop up and that creates a ratio between turbulent scale to chemical time scale, chemical to Kolmogorov time scale. So you take into account that different time scale, that integral time scale, chemical time scale. So all the time scales are taken into account through this non-dimensional number. So apart from the turbulent Reynolds number, you get introduced to these two numbers. So whenever you talk about any reacting system, if it is premixed or non-premixed, depending on this damn color or color, these number are going to pop up. And they are going to pop up because you are going to do some handshaking. You cannot solve your system or deal your system at the chemical time scale level. That's the idea. Now, if you see, if you have inert flow, then Smith number is one and the Kolmograph scale is like this. If you have premixed combustion, then you have thickness. So you have Kalovi's number, which is going to play a role. And if you have non premixed system, then your flame thickness is not important, but it depends on the local condition of the mixing and things like that. So one can do different kind of reaction flow analysis. Like you have, these are multi-species system that you are talking about. So the reaction doesn't take place. So this is a methane combustion. So in a, one can think about methane combustion in this way that it is going to produce CO2 plus H2O. Okay, this is not balanced though, but that's a global reaction. If you go to this kind of multi-stepping, so this is how the methane combustion actually takes place, breaks down to multiple intermediate stages, okay? And then it does the work. So this is what you have to capture, okay? And you, what you need to capture is that, I mean, if you have done the basic combustion course, then there you do some sort of a steady analysis and things like that, or equivalent analysis where you try to see the production and again destruction of the species and try to estimate that. But this is again an equivalent hypothesis. Okay. So ideally what it should follow. So it is nothing deviating from my basic fluid flow equation. So you need some transport equation. So that means now when you come here, this is an extra equation. Mass, momentum, energy, now species. So one, as soon as you solve species transport equation, you need transport properties and kinetics. Transport properties are nothing but your viscosity, mass diffusivity, thermal diffusivity, these are the transport properties. Then you need thermodynamic equation of state, calorie equation of state. Top of that, if you have a situation where you have a radiative heat transfer, radiative properties and things like that, then you can solve for those things as well. So, how are you going to solve it? So we have been already talking about that. So you have, I mean, ways, DNS, you resolve all the scale. Now, not only flow now, you're talking about species as well, along with the reaction. So you have to resolve those things. So that means DNS is pretty much impossible for a wide range of flows or in the LES is a good compromise and that has been heavily used these days. RANS, obviously, very good approximation. You need closer models, widely used. So this is what happened. So whatever you have been kind of uh, told in the scenario of turbulent flow, exactly that carries forward here, but the with add-on complexity due to reaction species mass transfer. So. Now, obviously in LES, you do some filtering in the space so that you get the system like that. So what LES does, I mean, some of the issues with the LES is that you go to premix flame, there specifically there is a very specific issue in the premix flame, the flame thickness, which is termed as the Delta L, which are very, very small. I mean, order of 0 0.1, 0 0.01 millimeter. Now that small thickness is hard to resolve in the LES, even the LES grid. So that becomes a problem. So how you define your LES filter, that's going to create a problem. So that is what you need to do some extra bit of working. And now, whenever you have a flame surface like this, especially under turbulent condition, the flame surface will have some speed, which is called the flame speed or burning velocity. The burning velocity could be of two types. One could be laminar burning velocity, another is the turbulent burning velocity. 
while you were dealing with the turbulent flow field. So again, in DUNS, you sort of um, close that term. RANS, you close in a different way. LES, you close in a different way. So if you see RANS and LES, how do you estimate this ST or a small t in the delta? So in LES. So essentially, you are trying to estimate this turbulent bonding velocity. So it requires some closure. So whenever you go to modeling, so it requires some closure. So in RANS, obviously when you do grid convergence steps, so it's going to give you some values of um, that thing, okay? So it gives you some closure uh, here. Uh, and LES, obviously if you do some consistency, consistency check with the DNS, then you would be able to estimate that, but that is what is required for your closure. Now there are methods for your turbulent flow analysis. So one is that, how are you going to do that? So you can do in a simple way. Simple way is that you can transform them back to a different space and solve for transport equations like you can do some sort of an fuel and phase gas. So like an, it's called the progress variable, C is progress variable, Z is mixer fraction. So you can solve in that fashion, which is obviously going to ease out the problem. Or you can track this isosurface of the flame front. So there's this isosurface trapping kind of analysis. Okay, premixed you do isoprogress variable, mixer fraction, isomixer fraction in the non-premixed. Or you can do some sort of a normal analysis, or you can do some sort of a statistical based analysis. So this is what we are going to talk about that. If you do some sort of a normal analysis, that's going to lead to you some sort of a flamelet model. That means what it does, you decouple the system. And then finally, your turbulent flow field will be coupled with the reacting system. How you decouple? The all your reaction system, you do pre-compute and prepare some table. So that is what this flamelet and all this. And that will have some variable like in terms of J or C, which are called the progress variable or the mixer fraction. And with the whatever unsteadiness or things like that you want to compute, so that table will have the pre-computed information. Now, during the time of the calculations, you solve the transport equation for these variables. Then based on your particular situation, you look into the table and face the information regarding your species and the temperature. This is how it works. So it is computationally efficient, I mean efficient, widely used. Other option is that you can do some stochastic analysis. That is the PDF based method, which is called the probability density function based method. That means every point you are going to solve the stochastic equation. And obviously, as soon as you solve some stochastic equation, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to consume a lot of energy as well. Obviously, I mean, depending on the situation, it could be accurate enough. Or if you are not taking care of other things properly, then it may lead to some statistical error. But these are the two primarily ways one can handle that. So if I kind of go back to the same set of equation, now I have noted it down. These are the term for the transport properties. Now I have energy. Now I have chemical reaction kinetics, which is add on other things were there. So this is going to create now more problems in the turbulent reacting system. So if you look at the overall transport equation, I'll have continuity. Now one thing one has to be because density is varying, no matter whether it's a turbulent flow or laminar flow, you have Navier-Stokes the momentum equation, you have species mass transfer equation, you have energy equation. And you see these are the different terms. So this chemical source term we have been talking about, that's going to be the problem because that is quite steep in nature. Okay. Now, you can definitely do some sort of a simplification. So obviously time you can do steady, you can make 1D, 2D, then you can have rate of reactions, then the kinetic schemes, all these simplifications one can do. Once you do the simplification, based on that, you can include your analysis. So this is an example of a 2D uh, reacting system with the, uh, I mean, direct numerical simulations which are done and you see the flame front and things, how it is captured and where the one-step kinetics has been used. Because with DNS, if you do multi-step kinetics, it's going to be a really problem. Now, if I straight away come down to average dance equation, then obviously, these are my RANS equation in the average sense, which we have already talked about here. 
So once you do the trans equation, you know only turbulent flow. There would be a Reynolds stress term which requires closure. Now I'll have a source term which is required closure. So this will be add on. Edward, I mean bonus problem that you have, and average quantities you can estimate. So but one thing one has to be kept in mind that here now density is sitting inside. So whenever you are talking about the incompressible turbulent flow, we have not even touched the density. But since it's a density variation there because of the reactions and things like that, so density, so all your averaging te technique is going to be a little complicated. So that is what in reacting system, instead of you do standard, uh, I mean, like we did this decomposition for any velocity, I mean, any uh, variable that phi plus and phi, I mean, fluctuation like this, instead of that, we do density weighted average. So here, so that we take the density into consideration and then we do the decomposition. So idea is that density should come inside the system so that we don't leave out that thing out that by system having a variable density flow. So obviously it's going to uh, be variation in density. So if you look at the terms, so again, this we have seen the Reynolds test term, which is not a closed term. So we need to close that and that closer has led to those different kinds of branch model. Now here in the, you have source term, you have turbulent scalar flux term. So now add on, this is what you are going to get. So either you are solving for any scalar transport equation or you are solving for species mass transfer equation. This is what you are going to get on. Now, if you list down the unclosed term, you have the Reynolds stress. That's what you have the different Reynolds stress model. You have the turbulent scalar flux. So you use some sort of ingredient diffusion assumption or second moment closure. You have mean source term. This is what is going to give rise to different kind of combustion model. Or you call it the turbulent combustion, uh, turbulence chemistry interaction model. So this, so all of this, if you see that I have the governing equations, which is going to govern the flow physics, then how am I going to kind of uh, and model them? And when I do this modification to the equation, there will be always some terms which are unclosed. And then unclosed terms uh, to be closed, and these closure are going to give rise to these different kind of models. So obviously, if I classify, so if you have any mode of combustion, then these laminar rates, AD dissipation, transported PDA, which are going to be applicable. If you now go very specific to non premixed one, then mixer fraction based fast chemistry models. If you go to premix, then flame speed closure and things like that. So we'll touch upon those things quickly over there. Now, as I said, depending on these things, I can have simple model like this. I can have statistical model. I have transport PDM model. So that means some sort of a complexity increase. Now, if I go very specifically turbulent premix flame, then these are the models which I can use. If I go to non premix these are the model what I can use. Okay. So if you see the simple way of doing that, so you have a transport equation for the reactive scalar. So that reactive scalar could be species mass fraction. So you have basically they are species mass fraction and the temperature. If you put them to in one variable, this is the equation of the balance equation for the reactive scalar. Okay. So one of the term, when you do the decompositions, you will get this term, which is the flux term that you use some sort of a gradient diffusion assumption. And that is where your Smith number comes into the picture. This is called the turbulent Smith number, if you see. Or if you use the average transport equation for the these things, you also get the source term, which is also not closed. And that is having a value. So how the source term looks like? So this is a typical expression for the heat release. Okay, so how you can model that? You can simplify, you decompose the temperature also two component, then you do some sort of a linearization. So this is nothing but the linearization using some sort of a Taylor series. And then you finally get the source term and you see the source term having an exponential term sitting there, which is extremely nonlinear in nature. So now this source term is going to create trouble when you talk about the modeling. And that is why reacting systems are so complicated or complex in nature. Now, what we are going to talk about in the next uh, three days or so, this reacting system along with the sprays, you see the level of complexity. 
So you can have some mean of that. So these expressions are going to take you to through that. So that's what the, I mean, you have the reaction source term which is required. Okay. Now this is how your Fabry average species mass transfer equation look like. So this is the equation which is remain unclosed. So you do that with gradient hypothesis. Then you have the one step global reaction and then the turbulence. So closer, if you use using the mean value, that doesn't work. That's the idea. So you need some sort of an, and that is why the, the simple models comes into the picture. So we talk about that. So the first simple model is the AD breakup model. So it was first done by the Spalding in 1971. So it was a very famous model and we tried to look at, so what are the basic assumptions in the very first chemistry? That means as soon as they come and they react, okay. So what it does, that ideally the turbulent flow field, which is there as the underlying flow field, that's going to only react, I mean, affect the flame front but it's not going to interact with the flame front heavily. And that is why you say the first chemistry. That means the kinetic time scale is not taken into consideration in that question. So you are kind of doing some simplification and that's what you say the simple model. So this was, this has, I mean, worked for wide range of flows in the earlier days, 70s, 80s, but slowly sophistication. I mean, like AD breakup model where you do, okay, since, I had the earlier variation of the simplified system. Now what I can do, I can do a little bit of more modification. So I bring in some constant and I bring in this mixing. So this C EV is the ADB square, I mean, AD breakup constant and epsilon by K, if you look at it, one is the turbulent dissipation, other is the turbulent kinetic energy. So whatever equations I solve, from there only you get this kinetic energy and epsilon dissipation. So, what it does that the effectively turbulent mixing sufficiently describes the combustion process, but obviously the chemical reaction is. So from here, there is a development which was done by Magnuson and Hazard in 1977. So they came up with the AD dissipation model. So AD dissipation model, what it does, again, still the assumption of very fast chemistry remains there, but the turbulent mixing time is dominant. So you estimate that like that. So you modify that source term slightly differently. So that is what the purpose. So now, once you use that for the one step reaction like this, so F is the fuel, O is the oxidizer, P is the product. So, and these are the stoichiometric coefficient for that. So you can estimate for fuel like this and estimate for the um, uh, fuel in the other, if it is less than the stoichiometric or greater than the stoichiometric. So different situation, you can estimate the. Now, there are further advancement, which is called the AD dissipation model, where you have, it is kind of a controlled by mixing, fast chemistry, but you have applicability to mean premixed and non-premixed. So you can connect between your, so advantage was that simple, robust model, but obviously you cannot capture the chemical non-equilibrium. So that means the local extension and things like that, you wouldn't be able to capture. Also, if you have finite rate chemistry effect and things like that, you would not be able to capture that as well. So these are the problem. So then you have this another sophistication, which is called the finite rate chemistry based model. So you have the finite rate reverse reaction. So you effectively modify the source term. So the effectively you modify the source term. So you incorporate some more extra physics. So this was also proposed. So again, here also, if you see, these are kinetically controlled. Obviously, this is the limit. Then laminar turbulent non premix case and the source term are estimated from the RNS equation. Obviously, mean temperature is used in the RNS expression. So effectively, the fluctuations and all these are ignored. Temperature is locally low. So you take care of rest of the things. So if you see that combination of the EDM and FRCM, so for each cell, the computations of all these are required. Smaller one is picked. So it's a kind of a mixing. So what people said later say that, okay, I have EDM which works for certain cases. I have FRCM which works for, so you combine that. So what you combine, basically you calculate both the parameters and try to see which one is to be picked up. So depending on the reaction rates and other parameters. So this obviously 
large range of applicability, but still you do not have the turbulence chemistry interaction. So and then later on this proposal, I mean modified done with the eddy dissipation concept model, where it was taking care of the local rate of, I mean fine scale structure and the local rate of assumption. So what it does that there is a source term calculation which kind of gets changed. So but it requires a lot of processing power and all these things. What it does that you kind of break down to the whole uh, kind of uh, computational cell into two segments. One is the fine scale structure where the reaction takes place. So here, ideally, you allow some interaction of the turbulent eddies with the flame drop. So EDC was the first model where it was allowed. So if you put them in a summary, if you see the laminar finite rate, solely calculation by the RNS reaction, so turbulence is not considered. If you see FREED, then the RS and the RNS reaction rate are there. And mixing rate, so local choice laminar turbulent, AD dissipation, so that is based on the mixing rate. So kinetics is not considered, AD dissipation concept. So it takes care of some sort of turbulence chemistry interactions and allows you to include the detailed chemistry. That means even if you talk about the global methane reaction, so that multi-step reaction that you have that you will be able to capture. So this is the first model in that sense. So, but obviously it is expensive. So once you come there, now you come to the statistical models. So the statistical model are what it is going to do. So you have to obviously introduce some sort of a statistical technique. So this probability, probability density function, which, so these are coming from rightly from your turbulent flow, but along with your, in, uh, along with your reaction. So what it does in a simple space, what you try to see the randomness of the variable and probability of having that particular event to occur. So this is how you define in the probability. So there is a sample space and you try to see the event to so probability of that event so that is what you try to estimate and the probability is either impossible or possible so that's how the estimation of the probability now probability of the cdf cumulative distribution function so you say that cdf the probability of the event which is given a space so it's a ideally given a domain or rate you try to see what is the probability of having some density so that's the randomness you take in. And once you take the derivative of CDF, it's going to give you the mass density function. So I'll come to that straight away. So the derivative of CDF is going to give you the probability density function. So that's the probability density function. It is what is going to characterize your statistical. Um, and obviously, it satisfies the normalization criteria, infinite, I mean, all these properties are satisfied. So you can examine a particular interval, let's say the velocity is there in V and dV. So you can try to see the probability of a particular value. What is the probability of being there? So if in this interval, then how do you get these things? Okay, these are some of the example of CDF and PDF, but yeah, you can skip this. You have this normal distribution and things like that. So, okay, maybe, yeah. Another thing is that the moment of PDF, so once you have this probability density function, then the moment, so the moment is going to be calculated like that. So this is what we have done even in the turbulent flow. So what is the moment? So if n is one, then you get back your mean velocity field. This is exactly what we did in the turbulent flow. Here. If your n central moment is there, then you get this. So, and if n equals to two, you get the variance. So in when we talked about the turbulence there, we have shown directly, but if you generalize that, these are the, based on your probability density function, you have generalized nth moment that you can calculate. And then from there, you can calculate the mean flow property. You can have the second order variance and things like that. So from there, you can estimate the joint CDF, which is joint CDF means you have velocity in two different planes. That means what you talk about now, it is extended to two different planes. That means, there will be two velocity component and what will be the probability of having that velocity component. So that's the function it defines. So basic properties of the joint PDF also you can have. So these things you can keep and obviously this will give you joint PDF structure and obviously it will satisfy these properties. I mean, the normalization properties and marginal PDFs and things like that. So here also using the joint PDF function, you can have all the nth moment. This shows you the calculation of the nth moment. Now, whenever you have the nth one or two, so those statistics you are going to calculate. And 
then you have the conditional PDF. So conditional PDF is going to say, if PDF of UT condition not U1, that means when I'm going to have that U1 based on that. So that gives you the conditional PDF uh, I mean variable. So that means if you have a sample space where you say that, okay, when my U is going to be equal to for B, so what is the probability of having that function? So what it does, it's going to give you the statistical nature of the turbulent field and that's the statistical information that you are using so that you can use for the reacting system. Okay, so what that gives, going to give you the transport PDF equation. So what is the transport PDF equation? So we have talked about this joint PDF function. So this PDF function, you can think about in a particular point location or other way you can think about this joint PDF function are having a transport equation in a statistical form, which looks like this. So this P is my joint probability density function, which involves the velocity vector. I have all the scalar in space and time. And that will have a transport equation like this. Now in transport PDF equation model, so that means when you talk about psi, psi involves all my species mass fraction and temperature, and V involves my velocity component. If it is two dimensional U and V, if it is three dimensional, it's going to be U, V, W. So if you see that one joint PDF function includes everything, and that has a transport equation like this. Now, how are you going to solve this transport equation? So this is way complicated system. So these transport equations are not solved in conventional approach. So basically these terms are there also, you see this local change term, then right hand side, third term in the transport equation, the velocity space by gravity and the mean pressure gradient. Last term on the left hand side control the chemical source term, that means this term, all these terms are in close form. So they are all in physical space, okay? So, but when you quote about the chemically reacting flows, the particle, I mean, particularly the interest would be lying in the chemical source term, which can be treated exactly. So that's the advantage that you have with the transport PDF function. But what it disadvantage is that, so now the right hand side, if you see, there are two terms, this one and this one. So this term contains some fluctuation of the pressure and all these things. So these terms are not, in the closer form, so they need to be closed. Okay, so for that only you require. So the first unclosed term on the right hand side describes the transport of the probability density function in velocity space, which is due to the velocity or the viscous stresses and fluctuating pressure fluctuation gradient. Second term in the right hand side is the reactive sp uh, uh, scalar, which is the molecular fluxes. So this kind of going to lead to the molecular mixing. So even if you have this, <coughs> sorry, the transport PDF equation, you can see that there are some terms which are arising, which are unclosed, so you need. So this is what going to give you. So the closer problem would be there, but if the chemistry is fast, mixing reaction takes place and all this, the molecular transport and the chemical source term balance each other. So ideally what you do, I mean, the right hand side terms which are not closed, you do the closer and that closer. But the problem is that, I mean, how are you going to solve? Because the dimensions of this particular problem is quite high. So it is not solved in a conventional safety technique like finite volume or finite difference method. So this is not possible. So the way it is possible is that you do some sort of a particle based method, which is called the Monte Carlo simulation technique. So this whole transport PDF equation is solved in a uh, stochastic fashion. So that's the idea of the transport, but obviously it captures more physics. So this is, there is no restriction of what kind of combustion model you are going to use it. So these are proposed by the Stephen Pope and which is a quite popular paper, I mean, work that which is Pope did. So who has a nice book on turbulent flow as well. So, but obviously the dimensionality, statistical error, all these are going to be issue for PDF transport equation solution. So already we talked about that. So, I mean, it just like you have a variable like this. So you try to see the possible situation of this particular variable in the probabilistic space. So you have that scalar PDF or composition PDF where you have all the variable and you try to see the probability of having that variable within given interval. And then if you have 
then you can calculate your mean variance, covariance, everything you get back from this probability density function. Now, another is that the velocity and composition, which is which we talked about that. So that means three component of velocity and space. Then this is going to give you a velocity PDF, where the probability of the velocity would put back, or you have joint velocity scalar PDF, which will have everything. So that means it's going to check the probability of having a velocity in a given dimension and also a scalar. So that is how the dimensionality goes up and you can calculate all the macroscopic property. So from the joint velocity scalar PDF, you can get back your velocity PDF like this, or you can get back your scalar PDF. So idea is that again, you can get back your macroscopic properties and things like that. So also, you have this term, Reynolds test, turbulent scalar, and all these things. Now, this we have already talked about, so that's not the issue. Issue here is the mean source term. Now, using a transported PDF equation, you now close it with this kind of scalar PDF equation. So, this that means you solve the transport equation in Monte Carlo simulation, and then you try to close that source term. And if you have a velocity scalar PDF, this is how you close the turbulent scalar. This is how you close. So you see when you go and do this stochastic simulation of transport PDF equation, then it's going to give back me the closer problem. I mean the closer equation, but in more compl complicated fashion. So let's not, so then you can have mass definition function, these things, you not to worry about that, okay. So if you look at that equation, which is uh, this term is chemical source term. So advantage is that the chemical source term appear in a closer form, but these terms are unclosed form. So one is the turbulence flux, another is the mixing term. So this is what you can get the conditional mixing for all the events that would occur for a particular situation. And then, so how the process influences, it's simple. You have a particular time instant, and then you have a T plus delta T. So you have a, so you, what you have the convection of the system. So the convection due to the mean velocity field. So I have at X location here. So X plus Delta, it comes here. Okay. Similarly, the diffusion by turbulent velocity fluctuation. So this is what was happening at X, then uh, X and X Delta X, then this was happening at T plus Delta T time. So similarly, micro mixing term, that means that the molecular level, the mixing, what is happening at the T and T plus delta T and the reaction. So these are all the schematic one to show. Then obviously this flux, you use some sort of a gradient approximation and once you do the gradient approximation, obviously turbulence mix number comes into the picture. Okay, so this is going to make the handshake in between your turbulent flow field and the scalar field. Okay. Okay, so an algebraic closer that you kind of skip here. Then you have the mixing term. So the molecular mixing term. So these are different mixing models in the transported PDF which are available that could be interchanged by exchange IEM model. So this is a way that you close that term. Okay, this is my unclosed term. So this is how I am going to close it. So IEM, what it does, the, basically, this gives you an idea about solution of this particle method that you calculate the particle ensemble mass density of the particle. So if you see one computational cell will have a lot of particles and they will have this distribution function here. And then you calculate all your mean flow field properties from this distribution function, which you are solved stochastically in the Monte Carlo. So obviously you can skip this. And now in the particle, what it uh, happens is that the all these particles, when you talk about their randomnesses, that is what the stochastic nature of the field, and that is what you solve. So you will have the velocity of the particle. They would be having a particular position after some point of time. They would have acceleration. So this is how you get the particle positions after certain time. And this is your random stochastic process, which is known as the inner process. And if you look at the change of composition, so this is how you estimate, and this is where your mixing model comes into the picture, and this is due to the source term source term because when the reaction is going to take place, then either some of the species are going to be produced and some of them are going to be conserved, okay? And the mixing term, the IEM model, the schematic shows that you have two different scalar and they always go towards the mean. So every particle 
they make a step towards the mean. And if you show in a transported scalar PDF, what you do in a flow field, you solve in the finite volume approximation. So where you solve the mean velocity, momentum, kinetic energy dissipation, and from there you pass the turbulent mixing and all these things. So the mean field you pass and then Lagrangian you solve this transport PDF equation, then the mean density and transport properties comes back to the system. So that is how, so you have a Eulerian sum model and the Lagrangian sum model, they talk to each other. So every time mean flow field goes to this side and that transport property like density and all this comes back. So these are some of the expression that how you can capture the statistical property of the temperature variations and show the conclusion from the scalar PDM model is that the, you have combination of the RANS model, then chemical source terms are in close form, then you solve the particle based model using random work and mixing models, which are going to give you this closer form. So, okay, so we can skip this thing. So mean scalar and the variance in the PDF equation. Now we can quickly come to this joint velocity composition PDF. So it is a translation. Now, instead of having a scalar term, now you're going to have the velocity component. So then all these properties you are going to get back mean component. So you can kind of leave it out. So where we can come. Okay, so here you are going to close this term you are going to close this term and close this term. So how are we going to do that? This is how you're going to do. So you have this Reynolds stress component. Now you see the Reynolds stress component which will arise in your Eulerian sum model that is going to be closed. And then turbulent scalar flux, which you are going to close like this and the mean source term, okay? So, I mean, Obviously, these are the expected value of the quantity R, which is uh, mass weighted. Same thing happens, but here, compared to your scalar PDF equation, this become a little bit more of complicated because you have this, you have this term and this term, but this all these terms are closed, which are underlined with the green. This is the term which is not closed. So which has, and this particular term having the, you can see the acceleration term. So joint velocity scalar PDF, you need those teams. So again, the solution method is same, but here you will have joint velocity scalar PDF. So I'll not go into that, but what you have, now you have the particle properties. As I said, they will have mass, they will have position, they will have velocity, they will have... So the scalar, so I can get the mean cell and the phi from the particle and every cell I will satisfy the matter because once you go to Lagrangian sum model, you cannot violate the global mass conservation. That means your computational cell, the global mass conservation has to be satisfied. And as I said, that each cell that you have, they might have multiple particles. So the total particle mass, they need to be conserved. So again, this is how it is going to be due to convection, the particle moves due to pressure gradient and viscous stresses. They also show different fluctuating pressure gradient going to affect. So these are micro mixing and reaction terms. So this is how the position is going to be calculated. And this DU is the generic form of the acceleration. So you have the drift and this is the diffusion, which is going to have the stochastic inner process sitting in place different ways one can estimate that acceleration. There is called the simplified Langeville model. So this is how you can estimate. And here different constants, these constants are coming from the turbulent calculation or they are kind of correlated between your Kolmograph hypothesis of the small scale dissipation. And or you can have generalized Langeville models, which is a little bit more complicated, which requires little bit of involvement of getting this term to be calculated, okay. Uh, okay, we can skip this portion, not that important. So this is, yeah. So what happens is that this generalized term, what you do, so you may skip this, but we can come, yeah, you can combine these things. So yes, this is what is important here is that, again, you solve the mean flow field here, and then you go to the Lagrangian sum model where you do reaction micro mixing, where this is where the particle, are solved and then you get back the, so there is always a talking 
between your Eulerian and some model and the Lagrangian sum model. Obviously, Langevin models and all this we have talked about. So let's show how you are going to do things. This gives you a bigger picture of that. So this is a PDM modeling and they're closer. So you have only velocity PDF, then you have Reynolds test which you close and the triple correlation. If you have scalar PDF, only the mean source term is closed. That means from those information, you get back this. If you have a velocity scalar joint PDF, then the triple correlations appear, velocity source term correlations appear, turbulence flux, so everything you close. Okay. And obviously the, you have fluctuating pressure gradient, time scale, micro mixing, time scale ratio. Okay, this we have already talked about. Uh, the IEM model, there is a micro mixing model, which is called coalescent dispersion model. That means ra particles randomly mix with each other and they go in pairing. Or you can come to Eulerian minimal spanning tree, which is the particle mixed with neighbors in a composition space. So this is quite popular. So this is known as EMST. EMST. So this is quite popular and known. And uh, often used or because this is slightly better model compared to CD and IEM mixing model. So if you put them together in that efficiencies, so IEM, CD and EMST, so interscalar PDF relaxed Gaussian. So this case it does, all scalar remain in the allowable region. This all of the model, conserve linear combination for this mixing in local composition space, only this. So you see there are some strength and weaknesses of different mixing models. So it's not like that they are, all of them are quite robust and generic in nature. But compared to that, EMST is little ahead of other two. So if I conclude this portion, what happens is that the in the PDF transport equation, your source term remains in the closed form. And closure of these transport equations are done through the particle-based method. Hybrid method numerically robust and convenient for use in combination of existing finite volume methods or finite difference methods. So if you go to scalar PDF, then you use only the randomness through the random walk model and use a micro mixing model to close the source term. If you go to velocity scalar PDF, then you use sort of a Langevin kind of models where it includes the pressure gradient, pressure strain term, acceleration and micro mixing model to close on this. Now, where are the applications? So applications, you see this is how the particles, so this is how the scalar compositions are. So, you see how nicely it captures the different frames and things like that. That's an, some example. And you can get back the macroscopic temperature and all the, or the mean properties of the system. You can get back temperature, you get back the species and things like that. Okay. So when it come here, so this is what we talked about. Now I talk about a little bit about the, uh, quickly the turbulent premix combustion. So transport PDF system, can be applied to any kind of uh, combustion model. So whether premixed or non premixed so that doesn't have a problem. So the premix model already, I have said that there is a, there is a problem with that is the thickness of the premix flame front is very small. So you have this kind of a, flame front where you have a reacting coming center. So the burning, this is called the laminar burning velocity, which is a kind of a proportional to your mass diffusivity to the chemical time scale. So what it does is that you have a very small thickness. So that gives rise to a challenge how to handle the premix flame front. Because the premix flame front, what happens is that ideally in the premix combustion system, you have your fuel and oxidizer, they are mixed before they come to the combustion chamber. Okay, so these are 1D premix flame. So you, so there are different mass diffusivity of the system. So you see this premix combustion, how you look like the different zone of the, you have a preheat zone and things like that. So these are pretty much covered. In, but when you come to the turbulent premix flame, this picture I have already shown you, what it does is that it actually changes the flame front. And once you do, it's going to change your, effective surface area and in turn the reaction source term. So that, this is a typical structure of the premix flame. So if you look at an instantaneous flame front, if you try to see the main flame front, then you can see like this. 
So important, so there are two important parameter in the premix flame. One is the laminar flame thickness, which is delta N and, and the laminar flame speed. And these would be the non-dimensional number which are going to be talked about is the Smith number, Lewis number, Prandtl number. And they correlate with the your momentum transport properties. So Smith number is ratio between nu by D, this is L thermal properties and the nu by alpha. So all this number, they are going to correlate. And I have already talked about the turbulent Reynolds number. I have talked about the Damkula number. Why? Because they are going to the Damkula number or Calorie's number, they are going to take care between your flow time scale, which is essentially think about the turbulent time scale and your chemical time scale. So if you have a characteristics flow, the time scale is your lambda by U prime. Your characteristics chemical time scale would be order of delta L by SL, which is a typically in premix frame. And delta L is your premix frame zone thickness, and this is the burning velocity. So your damkula number can be estimated like this. And here the turbulent length scale you have, the lambda is a micro scale or colmograph scale, then I can have Calabi's number, which is going to be estimated like this. So then I have turbulent error number, and then I can correlate back with the other system. So important factors here, which are going to play key role in the turbulent burning velocity, which I showed you earlier that ST and the turbulent uh, speed. So, I mean, how to capture this? So, I mean, earlier people used to assume fast mixing or infinite chemistry kind of assumption so that we quickly get to the system and then you look at this kind of, uh, I mean, with some assumption, you would be able to capture that frame plot. So, idea is that if you have a turbulent flame, this is what you get to see. So your surface area changes. So ideally you, your surface area changes and your burning velocity also increases to the turbulent level. And if you see the turbulent premix flame, so this ratio of turbulent flame speed to what happens is that the you use your mass conservation equation. So if you have a laminar flame front, so this is the going to come. And if you have turbulent flame front, then you estimate the turbulent flame speed. Okay, so how usually it is done, there have been a correlations based models which are available or correlations which are available. Those are kind of derived based on your a uh, lot of experiments and things like that. They have been quite popular. So here I'm showing a simplified one, but there are sophisticated one like that one, which is showed here, which is using a square. You have by Klimnov, they provided a different kind of these things. Later, Clavin Williams proposed like this. So there are different kinds of things. So idea is that when I go to turbulent premix flame, I'll have one important term to capture is the turbulent burning velocity, obviously, because the flame from gets wrinkled. And there are closures which are used, and those closures are going to use your information of the turbulent flow, that is the fluctuation. Okay. So obviously, that's going to be impacted due to your mass diffusivity as well, and all your integral scales of turbulence and things like that. Obviously, there are other closures which are proposed, so that takes into some, and these constants are they proposed for a particular set of experiments. So this is not something very universal in nature. I'm showing you some sort of a correlation to emphasize here is that these models are taken into account through this grid. So how one can do about it then, I mean, instead of using, so you can have this kind of flame lead model apples and burning velocity closer. Okay. Mm, you can skip this. So this is where you come, how you are going to capture that. Again, I come down to, if it is a premix flame, then I can use some sort of an ISO progress variable and simplified nature. And the progress variable could be defined in terms of mass fraction. And it always varies between zero to one. So zero mean one particular state, which could be burnt state or unburnt state. One is the burnt state. So depending on the or in terms of, so it's a non-dimensional number. So either you could define in terms of species mass fraction or in the temperature. So that is what you are going to solve as a transport variable. And you pre-compute your reaction source time in a table where you are going to fix rest of that. So in combustion resume, obviously this is your this is your product and this is your reactant coming and this is your burning velocity. So 
you need this information so that you kind of close these terms. So idea here is that you knew, know your length scale of the turbulence, you know your smaller scale of turbulence, so you try to estimate through this uh, system, okay? So these are the scale which we have already talked about that you have in the flow scales where you have mean flow scale, integral scale, Kolmogorov scale. You have flames where the laminar flame speed, you have the flame thickness, you have the time scale of the reaction. So th these are the scale, different scale which will come to the picture. And this picture I have shown you because the chemical time scale is small. So you need the Dampula number and Calovis number too. And what happens? You have a simple, nice flame structure here in the laminar and turbulent you have wrinkle. So this is going to create. So you have laminar plus eddies that is going to create the problem of the wrinkle flame shape. And that is what you need to capture. And obviously, once you try to do that, you need to take into account all this scale. And with this scale only, you would be able to. So idea here is that either you have the inlet boundaries where the energy will be going to. So this is your energy cascading process. You come to the small scale where through viscous dissipation, you um, dissipate it out. And this is where the flame thickness where you are going to. So what is the scale relationship? This we have seen it earlier. So this is my epsilon. That means dissipation. This is going to, I am at, at the Kolmogorov scale, the velocity. Then this is with the, uh, um, the characteristic length scale with the Kolmogorov scale. So this we have already seen in the context of turbulence. So finally, it get, get back me the you know, turbulent Reynolds number, Dampulan number, Talovich number. Now I will bring in this SL and delta L into the picture so that I would correlate with my underlying turbulent flow field with my these things and turbulent intensity as well. Okay. Okay. So this is a Broggy diagram or Borgi diagram, which is known as so you see the different Dampulan number and Talovich number. In Plimix flame, you have different kind of June. One, you can have strictly wrinkled flame lead here, corrugated, they're distributed and will start reactor. So you see the varying Dampulan number and Calovis number. That means premix flame is quite complicated to handle in that sense because it may, your flame conditions could be such that you may belong to some situation. So depending on that, you have to be careful about or, so this is the Peters who has provided a modified diagram. But idea here is that this diagram talks about different scales based on Dampler number and Calovis number. And if you go to the flamelet resume, then the thickness of the reaction zone and pre zone is thinner than the Kolmogorov scale. So that means my thickness is smaller than the Kolmogorov line scale. So that poses me extra bit of challenge how to capture that and capture it effectively. And if you go to thin reaction zone, my Calovis number will have been some rain where the reaction pockets may not pass in inner layer of the reaction zone. So that's what it gives me a restriction. What is the range of this number where I will. And then similarly, I go to distribution zone when the unbound and in between bond, you will have the interaction between it is so the Calovich numbers is always higher than 100. Okay. So that's kind of, uh, I mean, so turbulent flame propagation due to heat transfer and this P heat zones and things like that. So we'll stop it here and kind of um, discuss, I mean, finish the discussion to, uh, tomorrow. So if you have any questions, please, please feel free to, uh, I mean, type it or raise your hand so that I would be able to clarify. Anyone? So what we will do that, we'll continue this. I mean, then we'll talk about this, some of this, I mean, since we mix claim, you see this different um, situation then from here, how you handle the premix flames. So then I will move to that non premix flame where we'll stop and then Professor Sabik will take it up for the sprays from there. Any doubt or query that you have, Okay, so if you do not have anything, so let's uh, wind up this session. So tomorrow I would take it up from here. Okay, thank you.